Okay, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today, everyone. So today I have a really fun guest for you. Um, today, Carly Ann Compton is meeting with me. I'm going to tell you a little bit about her and then I'm going to let her introduce herself properly. So uh, Carly Ann and I met on a Facebook group and uh, that's kind of the story of a lot of these awesome people I've me I'm meeting is through Facebook. Uh, so we got connected because I was looking for people who would be able to come and do this um, podcast with me who were bringing, you know, whether it's professional expertise or personal stories all around being married, having kids. And um, Carly Ann and I got connected because you have a, a really, really fun story to share. And, you know, fun being uh, including good and difficult and the struggles, mm -hmm. but all really resulting in a really, really cool story. So um, I'm going to pass it on to you. You are a mom, you are an entrepreneur, and I want you to introduce yourself to us. Tell us about you. Um, hi, so thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, so I am actually a former teacher turned virtual assistant and social media manager, and I have two kids. One is three. That's my son. And then the other is my daughter. She just turned one and my husband and I, we've been married for five years now. So, um, I've heard there's like a, a once you get over the five years, like, yeah, good. But then other people say like, <laughs> oh no, that you're just starting. So I don't know what that is, but we've been married for five years and I recently changed careers. So we're going through that whole um, transition, which has been different. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're just going along for the ride. I love it. And it's so, you know, when I first met with you and we started just kind of chatting to see what we would do our episode about, um, I, I loved your story and we'll get into it in a sec, but you had the, um, what a lot of people have actually gone through, which is you started having kids right in the smack of COVID. And mm -hmm. so that, I mean, just your experience, I know a lot of us, like when, when COVID happened, our son was in like second or third grade. So we had gone through the really, really small phase, like he could entertain himself a little bit. It was a lot easier for me to work and, but it was still really hard. Whereas mm -hmm. you had a baby in the middle of it where you had, you know, there was no one around, but you and your husband and your baby, you know, the support wasn't there. You weren't allowed to see anyone. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was really excited to be able to uh, kind of walk through your story with you because I know a lot of people can relate to what you went through. So tell us a little bit about what happened. Um, so I, we kind of like planned it out pretty well. I tried to be a planner with my pregnancy a little bit <laughs> for him um, because of being a teacher. So I know a lot of teachers, they try to kind of organize their pregnancy a little bit to kind of fit within the school year. Yeah. So I, I felt like we did a really great job of that, but we did not foresee obviously what was going to happen. And um, I was a teacher at the time and I was two weeks out from my due date and I was planning on working all the way up till my due date. And so it was like mid-March and then we had a day at school where like one person from every team had to go meet. It was like a random meeting and, you know, I'm nine months pregnant. I'm like, what's this meeting about? I didn't go to it. And then my coworker comes to tell us what the meeting was about. And she's like, the schools are shutting down. It's the pandemic. It's the sickness. And like, no one knew what was happening. And I was like, oh, great. And like a lot of my prenatal um, appointments at the time, had been like kind of slowly weaning down to only me, um, which was also scary um, because I was used to my husband. He would try to fit it in his schedule and come to all my appointments. Mm -hmm. And then it got to a point where he couldn't. And then this happened. And then um, the pregnancy like was great up until that point. And then I got two weeks to be at home longer, which was kind of nice. Mm -hmm. um, two weeks like extended maternity leave before I gave birth, but um, it was scary leading up to the birth itself because they were unsure of who would even be in the room with me. Mm -hmm. um, 
or if I would be able to have anybody, I had this picture in my head that I would be in the hospital and like my family would just all be there and they'd be in the waiting room and everybody would just be anticipating. And it didn't look like that at all. (laughs) It was me and my husband in the hospital by ourselves. And then I got to a point where I needed a C-section. And so they um, were like, well, this is what we have to do. And I was upset about that. And then they were ready to wheel me out of the room. (laughs) My husband looks at the nurses and the doctor and says, okay, well, do I need to put anything on? Like, what am I doing? They're like, oh, you're not, you don't get to go. No. Oh, no. Yeah. So right at that moment, as they're wheeling me out of the room, they said, no, you don't get to go. So I had to go experience my C-section by myself. Um, And then once we got home, that was a roller coaster too, because usually you're flooded with all of this support. Some people even say like, it's too much support. Like they feel overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. We had the opposite. We had no one in our house for over a month. Um, And then we finally said, okay, we think that we need more assistance. We're going to let some people in slowly. And that's when the grandparents finally got to meet their grandson, um, which was crazy. Yeah, there was a lot of tears during that time, um, for sure. Um, The grandparents would come to the door and they would just look through the glass door at me. (laughs) Oh my gosh. It was so sad. sad. I, yeah, it was, um especially when my mom would come that that's when I would get to me the most because you want that. I feel like a lot of people who have a close relationship with their mom, they want their mom there once they have their own kid and have their own baby. And I really couldn't. And she was just on the other side of the window, just looking in and that's all she was able to do because that's what the doctors insisted they said don't have anybody come in not even grandparents nobody comes in your home so we were following instructions but it was so difficult yeah yeah no that sounds so sad and you know it's interesting because I like what you said about how you had a picture in your mind about what it was supposed to look like because so often I think that's something that we I think it's just human nature right you when you're anticipating something or you're looking forward to something without you even realizing it you've created this entire image in your mind of what it's going to look like and you get attached to it you don't even plan to get attached to it but you just do and then when it doesn't go that way that that disappointment and sometimes it comes with immense sadness and loss like that is so hard for us to deal with and then on top of just the disappointment you had just the the emotional aspect of bringing home a baby, of going into labor by yourself, bringing home a baby, the hormones and all the transitions that just come with adjusting, just having a baby that you're like, how do we take care of this thing? Like, it's just so many things at once, all while also trying to maintain your sanity, right? Yeah. It's so hard. So how, like, when you think back at it, what, let's start with the good stuff. Yeah. How, what was good about like having that time to yourselves and just nurturing that the start of your little family? Um, well, it's interesting because I feel like I do have a way to kind of compare and contrast because I do have two children. And so yeah. I had my first during the pandemic, which was um, a struggle because it was my first, nothing to compare to. But now I have both experiences I feel like in a way it was a blessing because at the time, um, my husband was also given like COVID leave as well. Mm -hmm. And he was able to tack that onto his paternity leave, um, like with the stipulations for it or whatever, it fit perfectly because, um, obviously our son and myself were more susceptible, I think was what it was. And so they were letting him stay home longer to isolate, Um, so he got extended leave to be able to be home with me. Um, I think he was home for like a month and a half. So it was a decent amount of time compared to when I recent, more recently had our daughter. Um, he was only home for like a week and that Mm -hmm. was it. 
um, which is typical, I feel like. So it was a lot of help between the two of us. It was um, a good time for us to learn how to communicate like as parents rather than just as, um, you know, a married couple. Like it was just another layer on it. Um, we learned how to kind of tag team a lot of situations, like how that's going to unfold because some people are like, oh no, the mom can wake up in the middle of the night and she can change the diapers and feed and everything. And that's just how they do it. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes other couples um, decide to kind of like you change the diapers and then I will feed and then, you know, kind of work together. We were able to find our groove a little better because it was just the two of us. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like we were able to slow down a lot too. Because sometimes when you have a newborn, like when we had our daughter, everything is still go, go, go. Because you've got to go to work and you've got to keep everything else moving. And we were able to slow down so much. The family wanted to help out so much that they would bring us anything we needed, like groceries and stuff. So we never left the house, which sounds so awful. Mm -hmm. But in a way, it was so nice because we just got to be which is amazing that you like, I'm trying to imagine what that would have been like if you had no family even around, like if you still had to go to the store and cook meals all the time, like what an amazing gift that you, as hard as it was, you know, what you went through, I'm so thankful that you still had people close enough to support from a kind of a distance a mm -hmm. little bit, but, um, you know, it's, especially kind of what you're saying, like having your daughter was such a different experience. So how do you, um, and maybe I'm jumping ahead here, but how, how was that like going when you were leading up to having your daughter, I'm sure you had all kinds of memories and flashbacks to what it was like when you had your son and how you were separated from your husband in that last moment. Did you go into it with a different picture in your head or were you scared to get excited? Um, I had a different picture in my head again. I'm much of a planner. Um, I love to plan ahead, but I also had reality in the back of my head too. Because for my first, I was like so planned out. I had my birth plan ready and like, I was like, I'm going to stick to it. This is how it's going to go. I'm not even going to have an epidural. Like it's going to be great. And then all those plans like went out the door for my son. And so I knew in my head, like to just go with what felt right and um, just do what I think is best along with what the doctors say and kind of find the groove at the hospital. My mom was able to be there a lot, which was great yeah, at that time. Yeah. Um, but I, Definitely had a lot of fear in the back of my head going into it. And then they said, oh, we're going to need to do another C-section. So then that was another thing. It kind of brought me back a little bit and made me very emotional in the moment. And, but mm -hmm. it was a slightly different experience because I was able to have my husband in the room for that one. And it was nice to know that he was there he was able he wanted to be there um he still talks about it today how it it hurts him that he wasn't in the room for the first c-section um and it is weird to talk about sometimes with our son's c-section because I'll say like yeah I heard him cry like I remember what his cry sounded like and like I know but he doesn't know yeah what yeah. that sounds like which is crazy um but for my daughter, it was a lot of planning, but also making sure I stuck to reality a little bit. Um, and it just was its own experience itself. Like she's just a different baby <laughs> altogether. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's there. <laughs> pretty normal, huh? Um, you know, and one thing you shared with me before that you said you'd be comfortable talking about is that you've also um, struggled, and I don't know the details, so we'll, you know, I'll learn from you, um, but you've struggled along the way with some anxiety and some depression. Mm -hmm. So walk us through a little bit, like what, what part of that existed before and kind of how that's been since mm -hmm. having kids? Um, I feel like my my general anxiety 
has improved a lot like since having kids actually Mm -hmm. I feel like I used to uh, work myself up a lot like I didn't know it was anxiety growing up and I didn't know it was anxiety even as like a very young adult like early 20s Um, and then that's when I started to learn like oh not not everyone like always gets worked up the way I do and I ended up realizing that I have generalized anxiety and I would get like stuck in anxiety attacks sometimes and stuff. And my husband was always there to like help me get out of those, um, which was really great support. But I feel like ever since, and I've never really reflected on this, but ever since I have become a mom, I haven't really worked myself up in that same way. Um, I don't really know what attributed to it, but I also feel like on the flip side, um, my depression has kind of amped up some since having kids. And looking back, I didn't know it at the time. I'm pretty sure I struggled with postpartum depression with my first, Um, but I didn't realize all of the signs and symptoms. And then also there was the layer of COVID. So it just threw in its own thing. And so I didn't have anything to compare it to, but I feel like that was a huge catalyst for my depression and I have been seeing a therapist on and off for mm, about three years before I got pregnant and like ever since then I've been on and off depending on where I'm at and how I'm feeling Mm -hmm. but um so I, I work on different things and I practice different techniques and I try to be cognizant of like my depression I noticed it with my second like I noticed it for sure like oh here we are this is postpartum depression I see all the signs I'm very aware this time and um, I made sure to tell the doctors that in the in the hospital too because they ask you like oh how are you feeling and stuff and I made sure to tell them like I have struggled Mm -hmm. with depression and they said okay we'll be extra aware and they even talked to my husband about it like look for different signs, like not just feeling sad, it's going to be more than that. Mm -hmm. And I was hyper vigilant about it Mm -hmm. to the point where I was like, okay, I'm calling my doctor. We're going to get this. Yeah. Yeah, Good for you. Because I think it's so normal. I think most women experience something, it may not be full blown, but symptoms of it, you know, and and some of it is just uh, um, adjustment, you know, difficulty with adjusting and just kind of like it's a depression that's more situational. And sometimes it's hormonal. Like there are so many reasons that women experience some kind of postpartum, but um, I don't think, I don't think it's really talked about very often. You know, I think Mm -hmm. Most people don't even know that that's what they're going through. They think they're just adjusting, but they don't recognize that maybe it is deeper. Maybe it's something that you do need to talk to a doctor or a therapist about. So good for you for being mindful. Um, What, if you're comfortable sharing, like, because I think it's important for people to hear what do those symptoms sometimes maybe look like? And it's not the same for everyone, obviously, but how did you know? Like, what did you recognize in yourself, especially after having your second one and then hindsight, you know, to your first one, what did you notice that you can point as postpartum? Um, from what I remember, because it's a little bit of a blur after, for me at least, when after I have my two babies, like that moment after is just like very blurry. But um, from what I remember, it's like not so much a lot of sadness and it's not so much like it doesn't get into like suicidal thoughts or anything like that. Like it's never that bad, but it's more of um, kind of detachment in a way. Mm-hmm. I just feel like I want to be left alone. I don't want to be around anybody or talk to anyone. Um, lots of sleeping, like extra tired, which you're tired anyway as a new mom. So that's kind of a weird line too, but lots of like just feeling tired, want to be left alone and just, you don't have that aura of like, oh, I'm a new mom. It's like, I don't know. It's just a different feeling. And like, I never felt happy. Mm -hmm. And that was another one of my cues. Like, it wasn't like, I was like, oh, 
this is such a great moment or, oh, I'm just, I am just glowing and this is wonderful. Like it was, I didn't really have those feelings as often as I thought I should. And Mm -hmm. sometimes my husband would point them out too and say like, oh, like, why do you seem so sad? Or why do you seem so down? And I myself wasn't feeling sad or down, but I also wasn't feeling happy. Mm -hmm. And that was like, that's always been like my, my thing where I know that the depression might be creeping up, whether it be postpartum or not, is like never feeling truly happy or excited about anything. When I get in those ruts, then I know I either need to talk to my therapist or my doctor, like something needs to be said. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, um, and thank you for sharing that. I think that the, um, that word, the detached or, you know, kind of disconnected is such a good word for depression, you know, whether it's postpartum or otherwise, because I think it's not always the typical, I think when we think depression, we think suicidal thoughts and just Mm -hmm. being, you know, crying and being sad all the time. But really, I think a lot of the time it is just that feeling of like, I know I'm here. I just don't, feel anything about this. Like, I don't feel any kind of attachment or connection to these things that I know I should, I should feel this way. And I just don't. And I think that in and of itself can cause the depression to get, it like brings about this other part of the depression, which is then like guilt or, you know, some kind of (laughs) negative self-worth, like, why don't I? Um, But I think that, you know, as you're saying that I was thinking for a lot of people, you know, some people have never experienced depression. And then after they have their kid, it it starts, you know, they have some kind of Mm -hmm. postpartum, but then it lingers. Like there's some, for some people it goes away fully. And then for others, you kind of retain aspects of it Mm -hmm. for a period of years or maybe forever. It just plays out differently. And I think a lot of couples don't recognize the impact that that has on their relationship. So first, you know, the, the mom doesn't realize the impact it has on her. And then stepping back and looking, it does affect the relationship. And so, um, how, what are some things that you would maybe feel comfortable talking about in terms of how, maybe on a couple of levels, like how, um, you know, it sounds like your husband was super supportive all throughout, but like he learned, you both learned together prior to having your kiddos, how to help you manage anxiety and anxiety Mm -hmm. and depression. And then it probably changed after you had your kids. So what are the, um, in what ways did you really come together as a team? And in what ways did you struggle and have to learn, like, this isn't working, we need a new system? Mm-hmm. Um, so I would say we le- we leaned into each other a lot during the time at home with our newborn during COVID. Um, we knew that we had to lean on each other for support a lot because we didn't have much outside support. It was very um, distant support. So when it came to anything emotional or just uh, more personal day to day, like that's all you have is each other during that like isolation period. So we learned to lean on each other a lot then. And then I think once that veil of COVID kind of lifted and everybody started to go back into the world. Um, That's when things started to change a little bit more because now for us, we were adding on a different layer. And for me, it was adding on a different layer because for me, the way that it was, I had the two weeks off before I had him because of the school shutdown. And then that led into me having him and I still stayed home and I still logged in and I like had classes with my students like while I was holding him and that went into the summer. So then there was no school for me still. And then I finally went back to school in August and then that's when a second layer was added for me. So it was like small steps, but it was constantly learning something. Um, because then it was, oh, now I'm back to work. So now I have to leave the house and now I have to go to school to teach. And then he's still working and now he's back to work. And then now we have to manage that together. So I feel like around that time, things started to amp up a little bit as far as the day-to-day stress. Um, And I feel like I 
was still dealing with my postpartum depression and didn't know. And so we had a lot of obstacles as far as communication. Communication was really um, broken at that time, I would say. And it was something that I feel like I noticed heavily. He noticed probably the after effects of it, I think, and didn't really understand where it was coming from. Mm -hmm. And I think I worked really hard to kind of analyze it because that's part of who I am too. I'm an <laughs> overthinker. So I was able to kind of pinpoint, I said, I think it's our communication. I think it's like lacking a lot. And so I think it was when my son was like five months, maybe I said, I think we need to see a therapist. We need to do some marriage counseling together. I think that would benefit us because our communication is not working out right now. Um, we were constantly like bickering and arguing about the smallest things, which takes me back to maybe it was day-to-day -day stress um, mm -hmm. and then not communicating that well with each other of how we're feeling and how we can help. So we ended up getting a marriage counselor. We did it virtually, which worked out really well. Um, the marriage counselor was a male, which I think worked really well for him because mm -hmm. he was a little more susceptible to what was being said. Mm -hmm. And we learned a lot of techniques that could help us. Um, and we still kind of use them from time to time because our communication has gotten better. So we don't really use the techniques all the time, but we keep a lot of the imagery in the back of our heads. Like one thing that's stuck with both of us is the therapist said, don't be a teapot. Like mm. don't have all of your anger and aggression and stress just like build up and not say anything and don't communicate yeah. about it. Cause then your top's going to blow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so exactly. make sure to ease into it. Always check in with your partner, um, ask how they're doing. We also learned like give each other a couple of minutes just to kind of almost vent about anything. And then the other one takes a turn and then you, you kind of start the conversation that way instead of one monopolizing the other, no one talking. So we learned a lot of good techniques by doing that. And I think it definitely was one thing that gave us uh, a good turn to our marriage because it was kind of not going the way that we wanted it to. So I think it was for the best. Yeah. I love that you recognized pretty quickly that you needed outside support, that you couldn't do it on your own because I think <clears throat> it's very vulnerable, right? Being in a place in your marriage where you're not okay, we don't like to admit that. People are very protective over that. And I get it. Like it's a, it's a, it's an aspect of your life that's very private. And being in a place where you say we're not okay and we need help, that takes a lot, you know, and I'm really glad that you did it. And I'm glad you found a male because it sounds like you recognize, I mean, maybe it was an accidental um, find, but it worked out because you just, your husband just did better with that. And I think, you know, when it, whenever you're shopping for a therapist, it's just, you have to know that it might be a good fit and it might not. And so mm -hmm. if it's not, you move on to someone else, but um, I'm, that's awesome that it, that it was helpful. What are some of the things that you still use today? Like other than the teapot, like what, because it sounds like, like you said, it's the techniques, but it's also the mindset. Like you just mm -hmm. learn to look at the way that you interact differently. You learn to look at each other a little bit differently. So what are some of those changes in you? What do you still use? Um, so one thing that we kind of were able to dive a little deeper with, at least with my husband, because that's a different perspective for me, getting inside his brain, um, is he comes from more of this like masculine point of view of, oh, I can't show my emotions. I can't share them. Like that's not, that's not something that I should do as the, the man. And I come from a completely opposite point of view of heavy communication. Like I'm going to tell you exactly how I feel. I might even like not overshare, but talk your ear off in a way of how I'm feeling, what's going on in my head because yep. my head never shuts up. So, um, we kind of came to a better understanding that way of sometimes he may have a lot going on in his head or a lot of feelings, but he's not going to outright tell me all the time. Yeah. Um, and we also like 
covered a lot of ground of um, how sometimes he purposefully doesn't share because I have a lot of feelings. So he's trying to be the structure. And so we came to a better understanding of sometimes maybe I need to slow down a little bit when I am communicating and trying to give my emotions out. And then I need to kind of question him or prompt him a little bit more when I notice certain cues about him that he might be a little overwhelmed or maybe he's upset. I need to kind of, how are you feeling? Are you okay? Did something happen today? Um, Because he's not going to outright tell me sometimes. And that was something we navigated through the therapy and a little bit afterwards, like we figured out that was our new communication style. Yeah. Love it. And I'm sorry, you're hearing my dog squeak his toy. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to take it away because he's quiet. Otherwise, um, so this is life. But no, I love that. And I, I like that you said, you know, it was a different perspective for you kind of getting into his head because that's normal, right? We're, we're, we don't think the same, even mm-hmm. if you and your spouse are incredibly similar in so many ways, at the end of the day, you're not the same person. And that's not a bad thing. I think that that's just part of life. And I think there's a lot for us to learn from each other. And even in how you learn to kind of look at things a little bit through his perspective and then him being able to say, Hey, maybe like, let's bring it down a notch. Like it's, but it's, it's how you do it, right? It's not like, yeah you need to calm down. It's, Hey, we talked about that. This is something that happens. We've come up with this strategy and I'm going to use my Q word that we agreed on or our, you know, whatever system we created in therapy or just in conversations. Like we both know that this is something we're supposed to do. And now I'm just gently lovingly implementing it. And I think that's the key is come up with the solution or the the approach before, like when you're calm and everyone's good, so that when something comes up that isn't great, you already have that autopilot, like muscle memory, like we've practiced Mm -hmm. this, we know this, let's go ahead and do it. And so it just gives you the tools and the, it's nice to not have to just struggle in the moment. And it doesn't mean that you don't struggle at all. It just means that you struggle less, I guess. Um, and, and that's, that's awesome. I love that. And, and it sounds like he, um, I I don't know that he really can relate to what you experience with depression and anxiety, but he's learned to listen to your experience and support you in a way that works for you. Even though he's Mm -hmm. the fixer and he's the masculine guy, he can put that aside when it comes to what you need. And he's not telling you to just get over it. He's listening to what you need and he's helping based on what your, your needs are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely been a learning curve for both of us, but um, we've done a really good job at looking at each other's like physical cues too. And I feel like that's really helpful when you have two kids running around um, that are younger too, like littles, because sometimes all it takes is for me to you know, I might be holding the baby or doing something else. And then he's like, you're okay. Yeah. Everything's fine. I'm like, okay. And like, that's all he just needs to like, yeah, it's all right. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that. Um, well, you know, it sounds like something that, cause not everyone walks out of uh, a COVID baby, with as much grace as you have. Um, But it sounds like it really gave you an opportunity, you and your husband, to learn a lot about each other and just to, you know, it's just the cards that were dealt, you know, and you figured it out Mm -hmm. and you rolled with the punches and it wasn't always easy. And I'm sure in the details of your story, there were a lot of hard times and there were a lot of like fear that like we need help or this isn't going the way we want to. But you know, when we recognize that this is important, then we do whatever we need to do to to repair it and grow from it. And I, I love that. I love your story. Um, So I'm mindful of our time. So I want to kind of uh, take us down a quick other path. So one thing that I am big on, and you already know this, is I... Um, you know, you and I met on a Facebook page called Boss Moms. So the 
that is basically to say that like, you know, moms that really, well, it's all about moms who also are entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs. And we, um, I love that you went from working a more structured environment job as a teacher to stepping out of that and growing your own thing. So tell us real quick about how you transitioned into that and what it is exactly that you do now. So that's actually a really good segue because one reason I transitioned jobs is my mental health um, because I noticed even though I love teaching, I taught for nine years. Um, I taught at the same school. I absolutely loved the people I taught with. Um, I love the kids that I taught with. I, I taught in elementary school. Like it was great, but the stresses of being a teacher were just piling up on me. And I feel like adding being a mom in the mix is really the big catalyst for me. A lot of teachers will say like, oh, it was COVID that changed things. Like everything's changed since COVID. Like things are different. The way you teach, the kids are different and all these different things. And I don't really know if it was COVID or being a mom because they both happened at the same yep. time. So I feel like personally, though, it was being a mom that added another, not a stressor, because being a mom, I love that. But it was like another layer, I guess, mm -hmm. that changed the game for me, because I felt like I was giving my all to all of these other kids at school, mm -hmm. um, which they needed, you know, what I had to give. But then I didn't have as much to give when I got home. Yeah. And I tried really hard for the last year that I was teaching um, to cut that off at a certain point so that I'd have more of my battery when I got home. And I just couldn't, I couldn't find that balance. So mm -hmm. I knew something had to change. So yeah. I decided, you know, my main goal was to have more time and have more energy um, for my kids. And so I wanted to be able to somehow work from home and I was able to implement a lot of my awesome tech skills. And now <laughs> I, become a virtual assistant, like my own business and stuff, which is awesome. I love the flexibility, which was its own learning curve, but I love the flexibility that comes with it. Um, and I love being able to just spend more time with my kids. I get to drop my son off at preschool every morning and I wouldn't be able to do that if I was still teaching. So yeah. that's, that's one thing that I'm really grateful for is the time that I get to spend yeah. with my kids. I love that. So as a virtual assistant, what are some of the things that you do? Like, do you have specific kind of clients that you work with or just across the board? Um, so I'm kind of in a position of pivoting my business a little bit. I was working mostly with those that are in the health and wellness space. And I still really enjoy working with businesses that are health and wellness um, geared because that's a lot of my own interest, especially therapists and stuff, because I feel like therapists are, therapy is so important for everybody. So I feel like the word needs to get out about therapy. Um, but I'm also trying to pivot a little more towards social media management, specifically nice. Instagram. I've recently like been diving into the algorithm and learning all about it. So mm -hmm. that's my new hobby. <laughs> Yeah. is learning about the Instagram algorithm. Right. That's tough. Good for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. I'm I'm excited for you and it is. It's a it's a whole new world when you can take what you know, take what you love doing and then turn it into a job. Like how cool is that? Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. And like you said, the flexibility being able to to work and make an income while also having the schedule with your kids is so special. I love that. So, if people want to find you, where do they go to find you? So the best place to find out like more about me and like dive into it is definitely my Instagram. That's where all my links and everything live. So that's just at Carly Ann Compton VA. Love it. And I'll yeah. link it in our show notes too. Um, thank you so much, Carly. And this was fun. It was so good to hear your story. When you and I met before, I just got a quick snippet of it. So I've been looking forward to hearing your whole story. And, and I'm, I'm, I really appreciate that you shared it with all of us. Um, and I hope that 
you know, you continue to to be able to, to pivot the way you want to with the business and nurture that time with your family. But it's been fun. Thank you. Yes, thank you All so right. much. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye.